Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Nagash, which is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma. And in this video, it's actually going to be my second video of the series of how to start an army. And this one is going to be all about the Oshrosh Bone Reapers, which are a truly fantastic army. It's one of my own favourites. Obviously, it's death. It's an army I personally collect as well. And if you would like to have a little bit more sort of enforcement on why should you actually play this army, please go and check out my why play video for the Oshrosh Bone Reapers. The only thing I would say to that as a caveat, as in that video, I did mention the Petra Elite when they were back in the day being really, really strong and sort of like the auto choose sub allegiance that's not a thing now they fixed it so it gives you just more options and what you can play in the book really is i think without feeling bad for picking the one that's not the most powerful with that so just bear that in mind if you go watch that but like i say in this video we've already established that you want to play them so this is going to be how you actually start collecting them and just to tell you a little bit about them just in case you're brand new to your Bone reapers essentially they are the elite version of death and what do i mean by that i mean you can think about your standard death rattle i.e skeletons and all that sort of thing that tend to be in all sorts of fantasy universes but here in age of sigma they're still the case you have lots of skeleton like empires and stuff however this is the next evolution because this is taking uh leftovers from a battle and from mortal lies so bones and everything else and then nagash with the help of his Sorcerer's Might and also his minions has been able to convert these bones into sort of like ornate armor and actually be able to construct skeletons. So there'll be like uh, one Mortec Guard, for example, would actually be made up of maybe two to three skeletons and have two souls within it. Because once he's made these constructs, what are these new skeletal beings, being the Ostrich Bone Reapers, he then also picks souls what are best suited for that unit's role. So if there is a really good uh, general, for example, in an army, he may actually have three souls in him, which are the best bits from three amazing generals in life. So it's a really sort of forged army, not what you tend to think of with death, which is just resurrected warriors. No, these are forged. If you're familiar to Stormcast, it's basically Nagash's Stormcast army, but not a cut and paste that is still very different in the lore. And then what the Ostrich Bone Reapers do is they go out, they make diplomatic ties with other uh, nations around them. And when I say diplomatic ties, really, they just make the other nations agree to pay a bone tithe, where every annual quarter or however they want to do it, specifying on each individual uh, tithe and contract, that nation will have to give a certain amount of bones to the Bone Reapers, which the Bone Reapers are then going to forge into new legions and new armies. And then eventually, when that civilization and that nation can no longer give the Ostrich Bone Reapers any more materials and they can't pay the tithe, then the Ostrich Bone Reapers do to them what they would do to anyone who didn't accept the tithe, which is annihilate them. And the idea behind this is that the Ostrich Bone Reapers are very smart and they know that it's better to um, farm your flock and get the most out of it rather than just butcher it all now and uh, take what bones they've got then. Farm it, you get more life out of it. Ostrich Bone Reapers are all about accountancy, funny enough, but in a pretty cool way. And also the long war, right? They are there for the end of it. Even though, like, if we kill all these uh, mortals in this nation now and we harvest their bones, that's going to get us, I don't know, let's say uh, enough bones to be able to construct 200 more tech guard. However, we farm them for, let's say, 70 odd years, we'll have enough to make 400 more tech guard. And they will pick that option because they are not in the immediate need. They're all about the long game. So anyway, that's basically the law behind them. Nagash was using, you know, skeletons, everything else. In the meantime, to hold back the, uh, basically the hordes of chaos and everything else that was against him, whilst he was building his Ostrich Bone Reapers. And now that they are ready, they're his super soldiers to go and conquer the mortal realms in the name of Nagash and bring one will to all the mortal realms. Well, actually wipe out chaos. So Nagash is the good guy. Some people may say I'm a little bit biased, but I don't think so. I think I'm pretty right there. And I do want to just quickly give a shout out to my patrons. I usually do this a lot earlier in the video, but I got a little bit carried away talking about the Ostrich Bone Reaper lore, as I do absolutely love it. So my patrons, huge shout out to you guys as you make all this possible. And my Morgars are going to be Sandback, 
Jonathan H, uh, Philco, My Vampires is going to be Mir, Martin S, Rouse321, and Max T, David A, Necromancers will be a Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolf Nick, and Michael W and Quad. So like I said guys, thank you very much for your continued support. It allows me to keep up this channel. And what I will say is anyone else would like to come on Patreon, there'll be a link to it at the top of the description down below. But anyway, with that aside, let us get on with the video. So comparing it to my How to Start Collecting Slays of Darkness video, in that one I started off by going over their Start Collecting box and talking in detail with that. However, for the Ostrich Bone Reapers at this time of recording, this date and time, which is 14 for the first 2021, there is no Start Collecting box for the Ostrich Bone Reapers as of yet. Now there was the Feast of Bones big box set which came out on their release because they got released alongside the update for the um, Ogre Moor Tribes and then they had a big box which had Ogre Moor Tribes in it and Ostrich Bone Reapers. Now that was good value however that box is not available anymore and when I say not available anymore you may be able to pick it up on places obviously like eBay and some third party retailers but it's not sold by Games Workshop anymore and it's not sold by quite a few of the third party retailers so I'm just going to say that box is now gone. So with that there's no way to get a discount when buying this army unless obviously like I say you get them second hand or you go to a third party retailer. Now what I'm going to say is obviously do that if you can because you're just going to get straight discount but what I will say is obviously you know if you're playing a Games Workshop store or anything like that you know buy where you do play to help out your local store of course. So when we get into this video and we talk about how do you start an army, i.e. what units you want to buy first, really it's going to depend on how you want to build your army because Ostrich Bone Reapers, every unit in this army is viable to a uh, competitive level. I'm not saying top tier, you can make a very strong army out of this, but everything in the army can be used at a competitive level. Apart from Vokmortian, which is something that is not... It's not a great model, I covered a lore video of him and unfortunately he's just too expensive for what he's worth um, in the game at the moment. But apart from him, you can really build the army how you want. So with that in mind, when I talk about what do you want to buy first, of course you want to buy the Battle Tome for the army. Now that Battle Tome has only been out for just over a year now, so you know it's still on date, it won't go out of date anytime soon. Or like I said, the uh, date of this recording, so that's going to be good value. Also, you want to get yourself the Bone Tide Nexus, which is the big senior piece for the Ostrich Bone Reapers, in my personal opinion, my favourite senior piece in terms of rules, but also in terms of uh, the model. I think the model is absolutely fantastic. I've actually painted up two of these myself, one for my army, but I'm both using them for things like bash reports, stuff on the channel that you would have seen as well. Absolutely fantastic, uh, great size as well. And you get them free of the army, right? This is an army that has a train feature. Use it if you can, because it's just free rules, right? And free models on the table. So those are the two things you're going to want to buy first, just out of the box, buy them before you do any customization of what you want to actually put in your army as itself. Now, there are different ways, like I said, you can build your army. And to be honest, the Feast of Bone set that's no longer available wasn't great value in the terms of building the most coherent force because you just got a mixture of things and the hero you got on there was a name character Vokmortian which I said isn't really worth taking if you want to be competitive right if you want to have fun and stuff take him he's got some wacky rules but if you want to be you know we're talking competitive here which then means on a competitive level it was never really that good value anyway if you want to build the most coherent force so the good thing about the Ostrich Bone Reapers is they're not too expensive in terms of a price tag right in terms of actual money now all warhammer is expensive right get over it but what i mean is when you compare it to games workshops and the latest prices which is absolutely ridiculous things like the lumineff in my honest opinion uh, way too expensive things like giants 120 pounds for one and again go third party retailers everything else to get it cheaper but i think all that stuff is just far too much money you know like the the latest Warcry box set like the uh, the catacomb stuff really expensive games workshop basically a being very, very greedy now, um, and this army was not really affected by it too much. Yeah, you've got catapults for £50, anything like that, but really in Games Workshop terms, not too bad value. So the first things we look at when we're building an army, right, is your requirements. So you've got your battle lines, of course, which you need to have at least three in a 2,000 point army. And I'm sort of always um, pitching we are, we are aiming for the 2,000 points. There, if you want to build up slowly, go, you know, like 500 and 1,000 and 1,500 and 2,000 points. 
absolutely fair enough. And I don't blame you. If you listen to this, that may be something you're going for. But your end goal should be 2,000 if you want to play, you know, full, big size Age of Sigma games. And for that, you will need three units of battle line. The Ostrich Bone Reapers only have two battle line units. There's none of this. If this guy is the general, then it unlocks the, I don't know, the Necropolis Stalkers as battle line. Or this guy is the general, your Morgoth Harbingers become battle line. That just doesn't work in here. There's nothing like that in this army, right? And this army can't ally with anyone else or do any other ways to try and get cheaper battle line. So you have to go with the two options, which are Mortec Guard or Death Riders. Now, Mortec Guard are 130 points for 10, and they are the basic skeletons you see in Ostrich Bone Reapers. When I say basic, I've already went through the law. They're not basic, right? But... They are your infantry, okay, rank and file, 130 points for 10 of them. Or you've got your death riders, which are 180 points for five. Now, this is the first thing you're going to see in the Ostrich Bone Reapers that most things, like I said, in the army are worth their points and are solid. But this is an expensive point army, right? So the fact that your battle line, if you want to go minimum on them, Three units of, uh, what's that, 10 more tech guard, that is going to cost you 390 points minimum. Before you go, right, I just want my army to be all elites, necropolis stalkers, everything else, let's just say, right, and then I want to have, you know, two units of more tech guard, minimum size 10 to be cheap, and then one unit of death riders just as a bit of a tactical fast unit, the points start stacking up really really quickly so as we're in the auto include like section of this video again it's not going to be a mirror image to like the slaves of darkness one i did because every army is different right and my experience with every army is different so what i will say as an auto include is going to be your death riders and mortar guard you have to take them obviously and that's, that's why they're in auto include so you make a choice now right you can either really build into them and that's something what people do with the mortar guard as an example because they can be really offensively output as well because they can chuck out loads of attacks of the enemy with minus one rend if you give them swords you are going to want to give them swords as well that is a point to make you can give them spears spears are cooler but swords my uh, competitive side does take over there in my mind and makes me give them swords because they've got minus one rend instead of the plus one range right and you may be going well i'm taking blocks off you know like 40 of these guys because i'm getting the regiment discount at that point why am I not giving them spears? So they've got so many of them. And that's because they're actually on 25mm bases, which if you're wondering what does that mean, it means that base size they're on, which we all measure from in Age of Sigma, base to base, is just under an inch. So that means that two ranks of your infantry are going to be fighting the enemy because you can push them base to base with the enemy, and that means two ranks of your guys will be able to fight. And with that knowledge, you no longer need that plus one range with the spears. It's much better to have that extra minus one rend. And lots of things in this army um, with the Mortec Guard and the Death Riders, specifically, if you get sixes to hit with their weapons, it's going to generate an extra wound roll. So again, I'm sort of posing this video to people who are quite new to the hobby or maybe been in for a little while. And just in case you are new, that's something that we do refer to as exploding uh, sixes. So like exploding hits, which generate extra wound rolls, which means you can just chart bucket loads of attacks at your enemy. And a list that I actually ran a few times recently had 90 more tech guard. Now this was on Tabletop Simulator, so I didn't actually own these models, I only owned 40 more tech guard. But just in case you're new, Tabletop Simulator is something I'm not affiliated with, or I don't get any sponsorship or anything like that. But honestly, it's such a good way to help you with um, the theme of this video as an example, to show you being able to test out different units and really help you understand is that something you want to play and help you learn how to build your army. So that's just a little side note there. But the 90 more tech guard that I used, absolutely fantastic. Uh, really good at deleting things. I took them in Crematorians, which was a sub allegiance in the Ostrich Bone Reapers that allows me for when a model dies my army, essentially when it dies in melee, on a five up, it does a mortal wound to an enemy unit that is within, I think, three inches of it. What's the range um, on a five up? Which is cool, right? Because then that meant that this uh, Iden FD King army that charged me with all of its Ishtling Guard on a, like a two up rerun and one save or whatever it was. Basically, when they killed me, they killed themselves, which is fantastic. And meant that you could have this lovely amassed infantry army, which I have to say, even on just the tabletop simulator, it looked beautiful, right? It was just a huge ranked up, you know, phalanxes of these 
Deathless Warriors, which was uh, really beautiful and something I might actually want to build to in real life now that I've seen how cool it is. So, going back to what started that little dive into was the fact that you could really push your expensive have to take battle line to the limit and make them not just something, oh, attacks I have to take from my army, something that um, you really build into and can be really offensive because the Morte Guard are so defensive as well. So they work really well. So you don't really feel too bad of it. Similarly, though, still talking about the battle line options, with the Death Riders, I ran a Death Riders list I came up with in my Discord tournament. I ran a few days ago and they actually did really well. Um, it was absolutely great. I thought having two units of 10 Death Riders, right, would be two big units that just sort of get stuck everywhere and they don't really move forward. But I had a dream that it could work and it was great fun because... I just had this really fast moving cavalry army. I had some leech caviosses with them as well to uh, give them continued synergies when they went off. And they were so offensively output. But the other thing about them was that a unit of 10 of them, each of them have three wounds. So that was a block of 30 wounds each, which then just made them so... Just a pain for the enemy to deal with, to be honest. I could run them on an objective and the enemy could charge me and they would... Unless they chucked everything into them they would really struggle to move them off that objective as an example um and it was just something that i've only had a few games with like a basically all cavalry list with um only one unit of 10 more tech guard i had a few games with it and it was great fun obviously you could push that further get more experience with it and probably do even better with it as well which is just a cool way you can take your army and there is a Battalion for more tech guard and there's a battalion for your death rider so you can really build into it even further there if you want to go you know what my battle line in this army is expensive enough in points as it is i'm going to just make it my defense and my offensive capabilities and then obviously chuck in some heroes as well to buff them up further however if you would like to try out some other units in there and just not just stop at the battle line units that are really quite good that's just the start as you have a lot of other viable options well be it elite monstrous infantry being your immortus guard or your necropolis stalkers which are the same model kit the ones like the general grievous ones as i call with the uh, forearms and you know swords or the guy with like the twin swords you've got that or you can build them into the ones with the big glaze and the shields or you could go for morgos archite or morgos harbingers which are very good as well Essentially, we group those four things together because they're quite similar. You've got your Stalkers, which are the most flexible because they have an ability in the start of the combat phase that lets them either reroll hit rolls, reroll wound rolls, reroll save rolls, or to get plus one to their damage and plus one to their rend, or like an extra minus one rend, and that makes it easier to understand. Which then makes them really flexible for great tasks. In case they, I don't know, they charge into an enemy unit that's holding an objective, they slaughter them, and then they're going to get countercharged. So then you can go, right, they were really offensive, and now they're going to be really defensive with their reroll saves. But you do have your Mortis Guard that play a incredibly different role, which is keep your heroes alive. That is their job. They can shift wounds that your heroes would take onto them on a two up, so it's really well there. There's a battalion, so you can play into that further you then move on to your uh, Morgast units which like I said your Harbinus and your Arkai. Your Arkai are a unit that I would say used to be my favorite out of the two because they could take the big glaive three damage weapons right however now that the Harbingers can take those all you get with the Arkai is just a five plus mortal wound save so go Harbingers because they get the three d6 charge and this is a game of movement I said it countless times before and getting a 3d6 charge and being able to count all those three dice is absolutely mental and great. Especially if there's a battalion you can take to Alpha Strike your uh, Morgoth's Harbingers, which is really quite cool. I will say though, with myself, I did build them as Archai because I think the armor just looks cooler. And it's just something I explained to my opponents before the game actually begins, of course. So with that, that summarizes your monstrous infantry. And these are big monstrous infantry and they are lovely models all in all. And then that really moves on to sort of like the artillery unit we have in this army, which is a more tech crawler, which is something you may have heard of. And it's a artillery piece, which is the big catapult, which is either 
absolutely fantastic and will wipe out a lot of things it comes across or will be incredibly disappointing to you and it will never do anything. And you can kind of tell it's been a bit swingy for me in the past by how I'm explaining it. And that's essentially because you have three attacks with this thing. It does five damage each. You're hitting on twos, you're wounding on threes. There's ways for you to uh, buff both of those characteristics or to basically get re-rolls on one for both of those characteristics so that you can make it quite easy for your enemy to have to then make a save roll against it. However, it has no rend, so if the enemy has a, a three up save roll in ones, or a, you know, even a two up save roll in ones, you're not going to get through to them. But if they have bad saves, each one that goes through is five damage whilst the Mortec Crawler hasn't taken any damage itself. So you can easily just wipe out blobs of infantry of 15 models if they only got one wound each. I did it, like I said, in the tournament where I wiped out a blob of 10 uh, Namati Thralls as an example. And that was just like a moment for me and my opponent just to go, wow, okay, yeah, that, that did that. Because every time I've tried to use it before, it's failed to hit for some reason. Always rolling ones for that thing. So it has got some use there. A lot of people are complaining about them at the moment when they go against them. But in all honesty, from what I've seen when I've used them, I'm sure people are only complaining if they're going against like, uh, like three or four of them, maybe two. But... Unless I'm just really unlucky with my dice, which is more than likely the case, they can be really effective and really strong. I would say don't bring four of them or something like that, because then that means that you're probably one's always going to fail to hit and everything, but the other three will do their job. And probably from what I know when I've gone against shooting, and being a death player, I've, I've gone against shooting my whole uh, Warhammer life, shall we say. And uh, I think it's really quite an interactive thing, and I'm not a big fan of shooting, so... Taking four of those things are quite nasty. They do also have special shots, which mean that they can do things to break enemy coherency in your turn of enemy units by just picking a model in that unit or wiping out. If you roll high enough, go see the rules if you want to know more details about it. And then you can go, right, your enemy unit has broken coherency. Let's say it's a unit of, I don't know, uh, 40 models even, and you've taken one out and now they're no longer coherent, being within one inch of each other. Then you say to your opponent at the end of your turn, the battleship phase, right, choose what half of the unit you want to just be wiped out because they're not in coherency. I, I don't think it's a very good way to play the game. I will say if you're playing top, you know, top tables at the tournaments and all that sort of thing and you're being as competitive as you can and it's all as cutthroat as it can, absolutely do it. No reason not to. Don't feel bad about it because you're playing at that competitive level. If you're playing just amongst your friends and all that sort of thing, don't, don't do that. It's a, it's a little bit of a little bit of a dick move. But if you do intend to do that, because you're like, it's a rule I've got on my army. It can be really good. I want to use it. I don't want to handicap myself. I would just tell your opponents that you can do that. That's like a rule you have. It's an ability after the catapult. You don't want to not tell your opponent, and especially if it's your mate as well. You don't want to not tell them. They stretch out their units, and then you go, oh, I'm going to do this cool thing where I make half a unit disappear. Because your opponent, no matter what they actually tell you to your face, if they didn't know about it and you didn't tell them, they will just go, oh, right, yeah, cool. But actually inside they're thinking, well, you know, you're a bit of a prick for not telling me about that. That's not very fun. Now, and I'm not saying you can't use it, but just, you know, if you're playing against your mate, let them know what it does. It, you know, it's just a bit of courtesy really as well, isn't it? And I don't want to get stuck into talking about the Mortec Core for too long, but I know it's very on the top of people's minds on the competitive setting which I wanted to get straight. But what I can say is in my experience, using one of them, it either does great or most of the time nothing. So I don't really see too much of a problem with them at all. What I will say though is I actually do own one in real life. I've got it all built up and magnetized and can't wait to get painted it as it's an awesome, awesome model. Really, really cool thing there. So then it leads us on to our heroes, which we have quite a few choices in this army because starting with the top, the big man, we have Catacross, the Mortark of the Necropolis. Now, he is a fantastic, beautiful model. Well, particularly if you're looking at starting an army, you could go, I want him as the centerpiece. He's absolutely fantastic. You know, he's like the first big diorama model that came up for Age Sigma, where you've got lots of those separate models on the base, sort of with a focal point of the centerpiece of him standing on a rock, essentially. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful model that I want to own myself at some point. However, he is a named character, which in Age of Sigma opens the question of, 
Is he worth taking? Because a lot of the main characters aren't. I mentioned Vok Mortian right earlier, who's not worth taking. Catacross is. Catacross is worth taking because he can add so much to your army himself. He's got so many buff abilities he can do, and he also is not too bad in a fight as well. Not the hardest hitting thing in the world, but not too bad either. He's going to cost you a lot of points in an army that is really very expensive in points as itself. So if you're taking him in your army, you can't just have him as like a side thing. He has to be kind of like the center or the main uh, part of your army what's going to tick a lot of the mechanics off. So if you go with him, you're going to have to go with the sub legions called Mortis Praetorians because that really, really makes the most out of him because that's his sub legions. That's what his uh, keyword is in his war scroll, and that's what he specifically buffs. He can buff things that aren't, but you'll be missing out on some of them. So you go Mortis Praetorians. It's also what the other name characters are from as well, which we've got moving on to Arch Liege Xantos, which is another really, really cool model, and is my joint with the Chaos Lord and Karkadrak favorite mounted character on a horsed, monstrous, beastie type thing. Absolutely fantastic. I am going to get him at one day in the future. And why is he good? Why would you take him? He is solid because he gives you reroll ones to wound against enemy units that aren't death. And if you're going against chaos, it's reroll all failed wound rolls. And obviously this is a command ability. You have to pick something wholly within 24 inches of him. It's not everything within wholly within 24 inches of him. You can re-roll. It, you know, you pick something as command ability, you spend a relentless discipline point for. And that's fair enough. But with the Ostrich Bow Reapers, something they really struggle with, particularly on their battle line, so your, like we said, Mortec Guard and then your Death Riders, they wound on fours, which really, really hurts them. I can't tell you in how many games I've had using Ostrich Bow Reapers where I've done tremendous on the hit rolls, and then wounded on fours, just get nothing but uh, threes, twos, and ones, and some four, fives, and sixes. It really, really does hurt them because there's no way um, for you to inherently get plus one to wound. So you can't bring that down to three. But if you can reroll ones, that will make an enormous difference, and you'll see it instantly. So that is why Mortis Batorian is pretty popular because you want to take Cat Across, that's the best one to take. And also, if you want to improve your wounding rolls, your one um, Xantos in your list, who's going to give you those reroll ones to wound, as long as you're not going against death or reroll all failed wounds if you're going against chaos. So you can see how he becomes an awesome include if you're going in Mortis Praetorians, the same with Catacross. So that's also something I, I want to bring up now, because as you can see, the layout of this video has been a little bit different to the Saves of Darkness one, because it's not as simple as, you know, what is an auto include. What is can be an auto include? Because your battle line have to be an auto include, right? And then you can really cherry pick how you want to build your list. There's so many, like I said, battalions you can aim towards as well. And there's so many heroes, more we're going to go through now, that you can put in your army to really change up on how it plays. That I can't just say to you guys, you're always going to take this apart, unless it's basically battle line. There's no real point of me trying to streamline it that way, because I'm just trying to force like a square shape into a round hole. Whole. You know, there's no better core in this army that you want to always take. There's no Chaos Lord, etc. So then going on to our next hero is going to be a Liege Chaos, which is like Xantos, but like I said, not the name character. And also a cool guy on a horse that's pretty good, pretty survival, has the free up save, and um, really does add stuff to your army. As in your start of the combat phase, he can pick one of your units that's wholly within 12 inches of him, and they can get plus one attack, which then makes... Your Death Riders, for example, four attacks each with the swords, which is absolutely great. Um, and that's something I just want to quickly mention with the Death Riders, is that I do go swords to them as well, just to get that minus one rend. I do think it is worth the trade-off. So he's also really good. The great thing about the Leech Caviar as well, and Arch um, Caviar Santos, is that they give you an extra discipline point at the start of the battle round. Because as we know, Ostrich Bone Reapers don't use command points, obviously. They use Relentless Discipline Points which are really can be effective as long as you play smart with them. But you don't want to run out, right? Because it's not always guaranteed you're going to start with a lot. But if you have a Leech Caviar, that's two. And Arch Xantos, again, that's another two, which would stack. So you can have, when I've been running my lists at the tournament, I had a Leech Caviar and then Xantos, which just gave me a flat four 
And I also had Arcan as well, right? Which then gave me a extra one there because for every hero you have in your army, you get one as well. And if you want to take a cash across, you get free for that. And if you want to take a Batanin, you get an extra one for that. And then you roll for every unit in your army on a six, you generate another one. So you can really play with this to see how it works. I don't want to go loads into details for that assessment points because that can be a whole new topic for another video. But I just wanted to give you like a little reminder there in case you were like, I kind of remember related assistant points, but how do they work? You use them for any of the command abilities that are within the battle tomes, essentially on any war scrolls you have or the basic plus three movement one for the Oshrach Bone Reapers. But you cannot use the generic command abilities, you know, we get a automatic six to run or to reroll a charge or to reroll ones to save or reroll ones to hit, etc, 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 which is not can be a big problem because you can't really all your charges but a lot of the time it's not too much of a problem and you might go what about inspiring presence your army doesn't take battle shock as well as we all know so you're all right there which is pretty damn good so that's just why i wanted to mention the relentless disc points now when i just talked about the liege caviosis because they do add to it including xantos as well then going on to our next one which is going to be the mortisans and the first one we're going to talk about is going to be the soul mason so this is a two cast wizard for 140 points, which is not a lot of points for a two cast wizard. And um, particularly as a lot of the spells in the Ostrich Bow Reaper lore are good, he can be seen as an auto include, especially how his own spell is absolutely great. And he can try and cast them more than once at the end of the hero phase, which again, one more details on that, go read his war scroll. But what that spell is, is reroll once to hit. And that works in shooting and combat. So you can make your Mortec Crawlers that are hitting on twos, reroll once to hit. So if you plan on taking maybe two Mortec Crawlers, something like that, you're going to want to have a Soul Mason in there because he can maybe give both of them reroll ones to hit, which means you're hitting on twos, rerolling ones as a standard, right? Which is absolutely fantastic. Um, then you can, if you want the Arch Xantos in there, to then give them the reroll ones to wound as well to really help your cash bar output. That could be a build for you there. Also, it's good for your Mortec Guard that are hitting on threes. Now they're rerolling ones. That's great. Or your Death Riders. It's really fantastic. And there's a good range on that spell as well for him to get it off. So the Soul Mason is definitely a big shout out in my books. You may go, oh, I like him, but I don't really like the throne he's on because it's got like legs and stuff. I just did my guy being held up by Spirit Host, to be honest with you. So it wasn't really too much of a problem. But. If I was to buy another one, I don't mind the legs. I think, to be honest, they're quite cool. A lot of the Bone Reaper stuff at first, which I thought was pretty quirky, has grown on me. So you've got him. You then also have the next more one I'm going to talk about, which is going to be the Bone Shaper. And what he allows you to do is heal three wounds back to a unit. So that can also be three wounds worth of models. So like one Death Rider, or it can be three Mortec Guard as an example, or heal up some of your heroes, your catapult, whatever you want to do. That's why he's pretty useful there. With his spell and his war scroll, it's not great. Basically, it's doing mortal wounds to their enemy models within range of him. That's not fantastic. I wouldn't really worry too much about that. But the fact that he can do a spell from the spell law makes up for that, right? Because those spells are very good and add a lot of synergy to your army. And then the next one is going to be the Mortis and Soul Reaper. And whilst the Bone Shaper was all about um, building the bones back to make new warriors, the Soul Reaper is all about killing the enemy warriors so then the bones can be reshaped, right? He, work, he does that job. And also a cool thing about the Soul Mason is his job is to basically, the reason why he's sitting on the chair, maybe looking a little bit lazy, like a slan, is because he is basically picking out through his mystic thoughts what souls are best to be reaped so then he can let the soul reaper know which i think is like a cool link there um so yes the soul reaper he is actually not terrible in combat for what he is he's your cheapest hero coming at 120 points and that's actually also the cheapest unit in your army so if you have 120 points left over in your army and you don't want to include in the spell let's say um He's the cheapest thing you can have. If you have 110 points left on your army, there's no other units you can put in your army, right? So uh, that's something to bear in mind. His own War Scroll spell, like the Bone Shaper, is not good. But he can do one from the law, it's fine. Or he can cast an Endless Spell, which the Bone Reaper Endless Spells, which I'll get to in a moment, are pretty good. So, now we got them done. I do want to bring up the Gothazar Harvester. Now this is something I wanted to mention with the Mortec Crawler. 
but I think I basically just got to distract all the Mortec Crawler and how much I like it and how I think it should be run, blah 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 blah. I basically forgot. So the Harvester is such a key piece in your Ostrich Bone Reaper army, depending on how you want to again build it. So if you want to go a lot of Mortec Guard, he is going to be good. Why is he good? Because he can bring back models to your Mortec Guard units and he can also be alright in combat. So what you want to do, and this is how I've run him, if you take two big blobs of 40 Mortec Guard and then you stick this guy in the middle of them and then when your units of 40 Mortec Guard take damage, basically you take your Mortec Guard casualties away from within range of the Mortec Crawler which then means that you can roll a dice and then on a 4-up you put a model back to that unit. That's essentially how it works. Again, read the War Scroll for more details on that. But it can be better than that, or it can be worse. But the fact with the idea of your Mortec Guard are so survivable anyway, that this guy, if you wanted to run a lot of Mortec, is an auto-include. Sometimes people have two of them in your army, right? So they are really, really good there. And the reason, like I say, well, I didn't do like a list of auto-includes is because if you're not going really Mortec heavy, yes, this guy can still help out other things, but you're not maybe making the most of the 200 points because he is going to cost you 200 points, which is the same as a Mortec Crawler, which is the big catapult. So if you want to take a lot of Mortec Guard, though, honestly, get this guy. You will not regret it. He can just make it practically impossible for your enemy to chew through your Mortec Guard unless they just chuck everything, including the kitchen sink at them. Okay, and then going back onto the heroes, these are two that I wanted to review together as well, because this is going to be Nagash. Um, obviously, very good guy. And then you've got his second-hand man, which is going to be Arkhan the Black. So first, let's talk about Nagash. Some people can make Nagash work in Ostrich Bone Reapers. I personally am not a big fan. I do not think Nagash is worth his points at the moment. But what I will say as a caveat to that is Legions of Nagash definitely not worth his points and shouldn't be taken if you want to be competitive in that. Well, Ostrich Bone Reapers, he has more of a play because that means he gets access to all of the spells in your spell lore that I said were good. He is bringing back three models in your hero phase like the Bone Shaper as well, but he can just, he's got a huge range on it and it's really, really quite solid. So he's good there, but 880 points. I, in my local like scene where I play and stuff, uh, there's a few better cores knocking around. So what that means is that I bring Nakash, it gets better cord, my army's buggered because everything's centered around the gash, right? So I tend to not take him lately, but what I will say is that if you can make him work, absolutely fantastic. You can take Immortus Guard to make it even harder to kill in a gash as well to protect him. The fact that your army is so expensive in points, the gash is costing you 880 as well. We've already talked about your minimum battle line is 390. It really doesn't leave you many points left over, so you have to... It will be a fun list, you know, it'll be good fun, but if you want to play it competitively, you have to think very careful about your unit selection. It's like in the moment I'm running a lot of Archaeon lists in the Host of the Everchosen, and again, sometimes I only have 12 models in that list, which can work, you just need to be smart about it. Um, so yeah, it, it can be worth using. But what I would say, going on to the next guy, which is going to be Arcan, he is something I've included pretty much every time I've played Marshall's Bone Reapers because he is like a mini Nagash for 320 points, so far under half his points. And he still gets access to all the spell laws. He's casting three spells a turn, so not as many as Nagash, admittedly, but he's still getting plus two, which compared to Nagash's plus three is still pretty damn good. And he does everything I would bring Nagash to do, not as well, but not as bad as only a third as good as Nagash. So that's why I like him, and he's also much more affordable um, when his points on that one as well. And casting three spells a turn can be absolutely fantastic. And why things also cool, right, is that I also have Nagash and Arkan from my Legions of Nagash army, right, that I can just import over. It's the same with my Morgoth Harbingers and Arkan. I can just import them over to Oshich Bone Reapers, so I've got extra use for them there, which I really do quite like. I then just want to quickly mention the uh, and the spells which they have in the Ostrich Bone Reaper army, and they can be really quite good. Now, as they are spells, I was almost going to chuck them in saying, like, get them when you get the uh, Seamu piece and stuff. But the Seamu piece and the Battle Tome definitely you have to get. This something you can wait for, but very good. You can take the Bone Tithe Shrieker, which makes enemy units minus one bravery if it's within 12 inches of it, and plus one 
for you guys to hit that enemy unit if it's within 12 inches of it. Absolutely fantastic, great thing, really cheap as well on points. And you've got the Nightmare Predator, which is basically this big, almost ghostly Mongol looking thing going around doing mortal wounds to the enemy. It picks a prey as well, which it's trying to hunt and does even more mortal wounds against that prey. And then you have a big uh, soul carrion sort of bird that you might have seen, you know, it's a big, huge, all these models are absolutely lovely. And the lovely thing about the uh, bird one is that it only costs you 20 points. And that means that when you cast spells, the wizard who summoned the bird is also visible to anything the bird can see as well, which is absolutely great. But 20 points, you've got a big base and you're blocking enemy movement around the board. That's the main thing I use it for. The also cool thing about the uh, spells is that you're soul linked to them. So that means that the enemy cannot move those endless spells in the in-between round stage. So you know that when you go, I'm going to go first this round, the enemy's like, I'm going to move the first endless spell then. They can't move them against you. The caveat to this though is it means that if you're soul linked to a spell, so the caster who summoned one of these endless spells is minus one to cast while that spell is on the table. So it is a trade-off, right? I mean, you can use it with Arcan, which I do. And that means that I am going to be minus one to cast, so I'm only plus one to cast if he's on full health. But it's still, um, it's worth the trade-off. Some people do take the Soul Reaper, which I said the most basic uh, hero you have in your army, the most basic wizard, to just summon one of these spells a turn. And yeah, he's going to be so many minuses to cast if he wants to try and get all the endless spells on the table. But what that does mean is that you're not relying on him to do anything more important. You can do RK on to do all the good stuff, all your soul masons, etc. So yeah, I'm a big fan of those endless spells and they look really nice as well, like I've already said. And that's we're coming to the end of the video now. What I just want to mention is the sub allegiances, right? And I think what's important to say is some of the sub allegiances you have for the Ostrich Brain Reapers can really determine what units you want in your army. I've already said Mortis Praetorians, you're going to want to have Catacross and Xantos and that as well to make the most of it. You're also going to want to maybe make the most of his benefits, so Mortar Guard can be really good, or take a Mortis Guard so you can make Catacross even harder to kill, or help out Xantos maybe, or Arcan, or whatever you want to do in that army. You then also have going on to Petrifer Elite, which now have been tamed. They're no longer as strong as they once were. What they get now, I believe, is the reroll save rolls in the combat phase instead of just plus one save everywhere which is something that needed to happen because it was just far too powerful before absolutely agreed but this can be good for if you want to take a lot of death riders as an example because unlike the mortec guard who in the combat phase can use their own command beer to in their wash girl that lets some reroll save rolls your death riders can't do that so unlike the mortec guard they're like oh can we roll ones to save i'm probably going to spend the this one point to reroll all my fail so you're also, you know, what is the point? Your Death Riders, it's going to be useful for them. It's also going to be useful for things like your Mortis Guard as well, and all your heroes and everything else. So really the biggest thing that would lose out on it is your Mortate Guard. I suppose you could say your Stalkers because they could reroll their save rolls, but they're probably going to want to do the plus one damage and plus one rent, so it could still be useful for them. The other thing you get in your Petra Elite, what's worth talking about, is you can make for the Command Vita in there, one of the units get an extra minus one rend. That can be absolutely fantastic. And if they've already got minus one rend already, which, you know, a lot of things in this army does, minus two is great. Or you can make your stalkers minus uh, two basic. And then with their own ability, you'll then be making it minus three. And then you can make the champion of, well, I say the champion, the guy with the big swords would be minus uh, four at that point. Because he's normally minus two, and you can make him an extra um, uh, two minus. So basically, what I'm trying to say to you can be very, very, very good for them. Also, Arkai can make a good uh, response to it, or your Harbingers as well, whichever one you want to go for. And then going on to the next one, which is going to be the Static Lords, or Static Arc, however it is pronounced on the top of my head. What that can do is, the biggest thing in that is it allows you to run and charge. So, Death Riders, incredibly fast, and everything else in the army, very fast. Because remember, you have that generic command ability, like I mentioned, to make everything move that extra three inches. So even your Mortec Guard are moving really fast, and your Death Riders are flying literally across the battlefield, just missing the keyword. Or your Harbingers can be flying in keyword and in spirit as well across the battlefield. And something I've looked to be able to guarantee your... Harbin just a turn one charge, you want to go all out there, which can work very well. And it's just a very 
useful um, ability. Your command ability you get in that as well as that means you can retreat and charge. So you can retreat and you can run and charge obviously. So you can really be tactical with Static Lords. It's really, really quite good. And is particularly good for obviously Death Riders and everything else it benefits as well. And then moving on to the next one which is going to be the Ivory Host. And essentially I'm going to say this one is good for multi-wound models. Because when one of your units gets wounded in this army, if there is a friendly unit within certain range of it, they get subject to rage, which means that you get plus one to hit with them in the combat phase, and you are also minus one to your save. So you go, oh, that's double edged sword, that's not great. You can use a command ability that comes with this sub allegiance to negate that minus one save, so you're just plus one to hit, which can work very well, particularly if you don't get your bone tie shrieker off, so you're not getting plus one to hit there. So what I'd like to say is this is good for multi wound models, so obviously your uh, death riders, but also I think this is a good one for your stalkers to be in, or your Morkos archi as well. As they'll be quite up the board, the uh, Shrieker, like I said, you try to summon, may be out of range for them, so can be very useful for them there. What I also think is quite cool with this one is basically how it works in the law is all the bones used to make this are from like beasts and everything as well. So they're all quite uh, best drawn is from Gur. And everything from Gur is quite, uh, shall we just say, charge forward, iron jaws mentality, which I think this is really quite cool. And it's something I like to try out. It's not something that's often taken. And one of the things I like to do is I say, I don't like playing the most popular things. I want to try and take something and try and be different with it and try and make it work as like problem solving to me. So that's something I like to do. But anyway, like I said, that's the ivory host. The next one is going to be the Noel Murad, I think it is pronounced. And what this is, essentially in the law, is Arkans Legion. And the bones that were used to make these um, Ostrich Bone Reapers were actually the skeletons that carried the Shaishan Realm Stone to the place where Nagash had his Black Pyramid and then he did the Necroquake and it all went a bit wrong and everything else. These skeletons are saturated in death magic, right? Because they've been to the edge of the realms, so they literally hold in Realm Stones which would kill most mortals. So the bones of them are saturated in death magic when when they've been reshaped into the Ostrich Bone Reapers that means that they have basically a good immunity to spells be it endless just any sort of like chaos sorcery or any magic at all and what it allows you to do is roll a dice every time one of your units is affected by a spell and a spell on a five up it's not affected so they're just walking marching forward in their ranks upon ranks and the enemy sorcerers are chucking i don't know fire bolts and lightning at them and everything else and they're just bouncing off them they really don't care and they just keep moving forward which really demoralizes their enemy and basically it's a big fuck you to lord craig which i think is always good fun and that also means that this is quite a good one for the meta at the moment because i don't always like talking about top meta in age sigma's channel because the meta always changes right and the armies that generally tend to be at the top of it i.e. Seraphon, are broken at the current moment in time. And it's not just them, um, it switches, right? It's like a wheel that goes around and it gets FAQ'd and changes. But at the moment, it's all about magic because you also have things like uh, Teclis that's very magic heavy as well. Um, if you go against another Arcan, stuff like that. And it's great when this whole sub legions can just ignore it, like I say, on a five up. And you also have a commander ability in the sub legions that can do it on a two up instead as well. Yeah, it's incredibly relentless discipline point, but if you're going against Lord Croak, yeah, you don't mind paying that if you've got it because you could really bugger up Croak's plan, which is just to auto win the game. So you've got that. I think it's really, really cool. I really like the lore behind it as well. It's something that I want to try and take again, and I really, really like it. You also have an artifact in that that meets one of the melee weapons of the bearer you pick. The enemy cannot make saves against it or cannot negate any wounds against it, which is a good Phoenix Guard care or something like that. So it's really quite cool. So sort of in summary, while I'm talking about these sub is what would you put in that army? Um, really, that one's quite fair of whatever you want. I'd say like when I took Arcan in it, I was like, oh, it's his own sub -legions. But in the game, as it really works, I'm practically ignoring most of the enemy spells as well. No, it, it, it really is good because you're not always going to negate it on a five up or even a two up so it is it is solid there and it means that your army that's generally quite vulnerable to mortal wounds in your army and a lot of mortal wounds are dealt by spells in this game particularly if you're going against zeech for example it means that you have got ways to stop it so your mortec guard as just as strong so mortec guard are a good pick in here but it's a nice sub legions because you have a mixture of things it doesn't really tie you down to one certain unit choice so then Going on to the next one, the last one is going to be the Crematorians. And this is the one that I mentioned earlier when I had 90 Mortec Guard. 
and was great because when my Mortic died, every five up was mortal wounds to the enemy in melee. And just to say that I know like you go read the rules, and that's like a big thing with these how to start collecting um, army videos I'm doing. I'm not giving you in depth on the rules or anything like that because that's not what this video is about. Where Nostrix Brain Reapers, as an example, get their long in depth army series, which looking at the poll at the moment looks like they might win that, so that'd be cool. Personally, if it's a deaf army, I'm going to have to spend ages reviewing. I much prefer it as I absolutely love death, so I'm excited for that one. You'll hear me say all the tactics about all of these things, so don't you worry there. Um, if you think I'm just generalizing a couple of things, just want to mention that. But the Crematorians does work with all your models in your army, particularly if basically you've got um, a hero or monster, it's on a four up instead of a five up, and still only one mortal wound, but then your general is on a three up instead of a five up, and it's D3 mortal wounds. And it just gives you a really nice, like, uh, counter to an enemy alpha or something or if you're just going to sit there and take a charge and take some hurt you're going to do some damage back to the enemy particularly if you've got harvesters to also bring back your models and maybe you've got some bone shapers and arcan as well to bring back even more models right and with that that is going to come to the end of the video and i'll be honest with you guys i didn't know this one was going to be as long as the slaves darkness one because i've got more experience with slaves of darkness but i think when this one's done it's going to be round about exactly the same sort of minutes long what i will say is also going forward with these um how to start collecting certain army videos just bear in mind if it's an army i don't personally do then I won't be able to give as much input on it. So whereas this video is over 50 minutes long, if I do one for an army I don't personally do, it may be around 20 minutes long. So just bear that in mind. They're not all going to be equal because I don't know the ins and outs of every single army out there because personally, when it comes to how to start collecting them, I haven't collected every single army, surprise, surprise. But I have butterflied around most of the armies out there, but obviously times change and things that you would buy five years ago for the army to how to start collecting it may have changed. But most importantly, I really hope that you've learned something in this video and it's really helped you towards maybe how to start collecting Ostrich Bone Reapers or for some reason, if this is the video you watch just to give you that extra nudge to push you over to start on your Ostrich Bone Reaper army, I'm happy to hear that as well. I also want to say um, thank you to all you guys as well for watching my How to Start Slay Start this video. That was my most popular video like of it being premiered I've done for a long time, if not ever. That has been a really nice show to me that you guys um, are really liking the like editing I've been doing the videos now that I've got the new software, but beyond anything else, it's showing me that uh, you guys are showing a big support towards the channel, especially when you're liking the uh, videos and you're subscribing on the videos as well and you're hitting that bell notification. If you enjoyed this one as well, please smash that like button, smash that subscribe button, and smash the uh, bell notification if you haven't already really really does help the channel and it's the best way to do it which is absolutely free if you've got any questions as well for me put it in the comments down below It'd be absolutely great and like i said when i saw the slave start one i hope the same with this one it's a really big sign that you guys are really happy for me to push this series forward as it is going to be a long one um probably similar to how long it took me to the why play videos which was about a year so we'll see how well how quickly we can do these ones but it may take some time before we go though, I do want to do a massive shout out to my patrons and I know I do it a lot but honestly, like I say, these guys make it all possible as it makes me be able to justify continuing this channel. So that is going to be my Morgas, which are Sandback, Jonathan H and Philco. Guys, at that tier, absolutely huge support, I don't know what to say, words don't describe it enough, thank you so much. My Vampires, which is Mir, Martin S, Rouse321, Max T and David A. Again guys, that tier as well, it makes a huge difference for the channel and then my necromancers which is Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolf Nick, Michael W and Quad. Guys it really helps and you're doing a fantastic job by supporting me. Thank you so much for all of that help. What I would like to say is that if you want to check out and become a patron of mine to keep the channel going you'll see in the description down below at the top of it there's a link to my patreon even if you just consider giving anything guys even just a dollar a month it really goes a long way to keep the channel going like I've already mentioned. What I will say guys though, you know, if you can't afford to do that, like I say, just smash that like button and that subscribe button haven't already, bell button, and that will be really helpful as well. If you've got any questions, like I say, put it in the comments. If you've got anything that you agree with me, you know, obviously put that in the comments, but also if you've got anything that you disagree with me and you think that I've missed something, please let me know that in the comments as well, as we're all here to learn, aren't we, at the end of the day? I'm sure we can all learn from each other. So until next time, guys, Remember to stay safe, wear a mask, wash your hands, stay hygienic so we can start gaming at some point soon. 
And of course, remember, more importantly, until next time, Nagash is all, and all is one in Nagash.